So after a year of unkept promises and still getting more sub uh, subscribers, I'm back. So here's a new raw therapy tutorial. I'd like to start by saying that the program I believe has updated twice since my last tutorial. I'm not going to go through every single new detail because there's only a few of them, mainly in some of the more advanced image processing algorithms and some renaming. I will, however, address where these changes are when they come up during the photo editing process. However, I wanted to take this tutorial to show off the batch editing capabilities of raw therapy because I've gotten quite a few questions about them. And before any of you ask in the comments, unfortunately, raw therapy still hasn't updated its main branch with localized editing, such as spot removal or uh, localized color changes. There is still a branch of raw therapy with that present. However, I do not use it. And I can't recall the name off the top of my head. I will put that down in the comments like last time. So to start with, I want to talk about what you need in order to do uh, batch editing. So you really want your photos to be taken at relatively the same exposures and camera settings, and you want them to be similar enough that batch editing actually applies. Typically, this is good if you have a series of portraits or other photographs where you have a consistent lighting and a consistent setup and a consistent subject. In this case, I'm actually going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to edit some photos I took on a road trip through Texas. However, much of the lighting is pretty consistent, and all of my camera settings will be the same through the pictures that I'm going to edit. So to start with, you want to open up a picture that might likely have some of the more problematic features of a photograph for uh, your set. So like things that you will really need to address closely. So I'm going to start with this picture here of an abandoned building and some trees because those pulling up those details will be fairly difficult. One thing to note is also that rotation will translate through your batch edits unless you uh, deselect it. So I will demonstrate that later. But I just wanted to note that given that this picture is crooked, like most of the photographs that I take, unfortunately. So to start with, I'd like to reset the processing profile back to neutral. I know that raw therapy does some good things by default, but I want to do all of it myself because that's how I am. And I'm going to go through and do my tone curves again. Nothing has changed here, except they want to actually show something that I discovered since my last tutorial, which is that you actually have different profiles for your tone curves. So if you go through, if there's two tone curves, you can actually have them uh, have different response profiles. So one of them that I typically like is a film-like profile, and these have a tendency to couple color and tone in a way that is not just as simple as, okay, when you make the darks darker, the dark stuff gets darker and the lights get lighter. It also changes the way that the saturation of those uh, colors will respond to your edits. So in film like that is attempting to mim mimic old fashioned film photography. And I've actually started doing that in the meantime and have enjoyed the way that that impacts colors. So I do a little bit of uh, this film like tone curve. Now, if I change this actually over to a luminance tone curve, which only deals with lights and darks in the photo, you can see that it's actually going to suck out a lot of the color that was enhanced by this film like tone curve. All right. Also, probably the eagle-eyed among you will notice that there is in fact a dot in this photo of dust that was on my sensor. This, because raw therapy does not have the capabilities to remove this, I'll have to remove this later in GIMP, and I can also video that for a short tutorial on how to actually remove uh, dust from your photographs without raw therapy so that you know how to do, add that into your processing workflow. So just to clarify any jumpiness in this video that might not have been present in the old video, I'm just going back and making sure that I'm not repeating too much from the previous video and also that I'm talking about the right updates in terms of what has changed in the program. There's actually been several updates, like I said, from the previous program. So I want to make sure that this is relevant from going from my previous tutorial to the most up-to-date uh, version of the program. And one major update that I found incredibly useful was the sort of demotion of Retinex to this advanced tab, which is new from the previous updates. And what is in here is stuff like I said, Retinex or this CIE color appearance model that was used to be at the bottom of the exposure tab. And this is good because they also added in new features that are a lot easier to use, such as dynamic range compression, which 
makes your image look a lot more like an HDR image, even more so than tone mapping does in regards to bringing your shadows and highlights back to a normal place. So essentially darkening your highlights, brightening up your shadows, and this can actually really reduce the contrast of your image. Some people might like that look. I don't actually, so I have to go and recompensate in the tone curves. So I probably should have done this first, but it does really help and bring out parts of the image that you wouldn't otherwise be able to see. So I'm gonna go and turn that on now. And one thing you can see is that actually I brought down the amount during some tinkering uh, with this with the recording off. Sorry about that. So it actually starts, I believe, at a default value of 50, like most features on this program. So you can adjust the, your amount. So if you bring it way up, you can see that it reduces most of the contrast, but at the same time, the shadows and highlights, like this window here, are actually really visible. It does, of course, contribute noise, but that's what happens whenever you're trying to bring out details from shadows. You see with nothing, you can almost see nothing in that window. So I'm going to bring that down to about like there. Another thing you can do here is you can change the anchor. So what it kind of picks as a midpoint of your uh, lights and darks in the photo. I'm gonna bring that up a little bit. It's a bit similar to changing the exposure compensation. I'm not entirely sure what the difference is under the hood, but all right, that looks pretty good to me. Then I'm going to turn on tone mapping like I've done before, bring out some of those details and tweak my tone curve to fit. Right. And now I'm going to go over into the color tab, adjust my white balance. I'm just going to use the auto white balance for now, just for sake of speeding this up for batch editing. And also I'm going to increase my vibrance. There we go. All right, so some other new features that have been added are in the details tab. These include local contrast, which increases your contrast at a much smaller level than the tone curves would. So here it's actually just got a radius of 80 pixels and you can tweak how far you want that contrast range to be. Um, one thing I do find is it has a tendency, especially at stronger levels, to really kind of burn out. So like you see like it just kind of clips to black or clips to white. So this is in like your darkness and lightness levels. So I'm gonna bring that back down best used a little more sparingly and with some being cognizant of what looks like at 100% so that you don't end up clipping any of that detail you tried to bring out earlier. Unless of course you like that effect, which is entirely possible. I'm also going to add in some noise reduction and some impulse noise reduction and some defringe because this is, an, this is taken on a not so great telephoto lens and also a new tool that they've added in here is haze removal. So this is very similar to the feature in Lightroom and it attempts to remove haze from the picture by darkening up those portions that appear to be lightened by dust or distance or high uh, air moisture. That's actually probably not the case in this photo because it's pretty arid out there. But anyway, you can see that this really brings out your details Sometimes I find this to be too much, particularly in the foreground. So I like to reduce the strength of that. You can tweak this depth parameter here. This is a, this depth parameter corresponds to a uh, mapping of your features in your photo. You can actually see this map here. I don't actually know what corresponds to light and dark though. This, again, this is a new feature and I don't know what's going on under the hood all the time. But it really is good for bringing out detail in, those, in the sky and bringing out the fact that, once again, I didn't clean my sensor. All right. So I just want to go through, make a couple other final adjustments to the tone curves because all of these features have a tendency to tweak my results there. Again, this all is just kind of to taste. Your own mileage will vary with this and how much uh, in terms of all these features. All right. So I think that's good for now. So I'm now going to put this to the queue. What this does is it puts all of your photos again in a queue of 
uh, the photographs to be edited and processed by the computer. This means that you won't take a performance hit while you're going through and doing your batch editing. All right, so that's just this gear icon here. And if you see now there's this little uh, one popped up over here in the queue. And this shows all of your options for the actual batch editing itself. I will uh, de go through this a little bit more once I have some more photos in here just to show you what your options are for export. So we can go back to the editor. If you notice, there's this scroll bar up at the top. So if your picture is pretty close in the folder to uh, the next one you want to add to your batch editing, this is really convenient. So one, so the way you copy your processing profiles are you right click, and then you just go to uh, processing profile operations, copy, and then you take the next photo you want to edit. So say this photo grain silos here, I'm just going to open that up now because it's unedited and it will show you what happens when you apply that processing profile. So you can right click again, hit processing profile operations, and you can uh, apply a tree save profile that you have, or you can just paste from that copy I did there. We're just going to click paste. And then all of a sudden you can see the picture already looks a thousand times better because it's copying those edits from this photo here onto this one here. All right. And then just like before, if you want to make any edits, you can just tweak the photo a little bit. This won't impact your other photo at all, but it also won't uh, impact your copied processing profile. So if I go over now to this picture here, it's going to paste the same tone curves from the previous image. So the one of the abandoned house. And bam, your processing profiles are applied. You notice though that tone curve is not the same as this tone curve, but it is the same as this one because this is the processing profile that we copied onto it. All right. And so in terms of rotation, like I said there, so if I go in here and I actually rotate the image by selecting your straight line. So let's say that this roof line is straight. Apparently it already is straight, so let's pick something else. All right, so if I select that as my straight line, now you see the picture has been rotated. And if I copy this processing profile again and paste it on this photograph, you'll notice that now the photo rotates. But I can just undo that, hit Control Z. And if I don't want that to happen, I can hit Paste Partial and it gives us all these options. So if I click everything, it picks all of the settings you could possibly have changed. Now, if I want to change only the rotational settings, I can go into this composition settings tab right here and just uncheck rotation. This means it will not copy the rotation from the previous image. And then if I just hit OK, just exactly the same profile that was on there before. All right, so let's put these two images to the queue and take a look at that. So now you can see all three images are here in my queue, all edited using that batch uh, editing protocol. So just copying those processing profiles over. And so I can now pick where I want to output my photos to. So you can use a template here. So this just goes with the original path to the photo. So this is just the same folder, the rest of my pictures from Texas. And now it's going to create a new folder entitled converted and it's going to save those pictures there. Over here, because I have that dust, I don't want to actually use a compressed processing pro, uh, because I have that dust, I don't want to use a compressed image format and I want to import into GIMP as a TIFF. So I can go over here and change this over to an 8-bit TIFF file. And now I just hit this little toggle switch here and it's going to automatically process my photos and save them into that converted folder. All right, so now the processing is done. You can see that this is empty. I sped it up a little bit because even though my computer is decently fast, I don't want to waste your time. And I'm just going to pull over the folder from my other screen. And as you can see, it made this new folder entitled converted. And in there are my three TIFF files along with their out PP3 files, just like uh, when you normally edit a photo, except now it's in its own subfolder that I designated. All right. And so my next tutorial, which I'm actually going to make in the same sitting, will be removing the dust in GIMP so that you don't have to wait on that.